This guy right here, the gecko, and uh, all of the uh, the whole process of building will be uh, covered. It's a, it's going to be a very complete uh, series. So I hope you join me, and uh, we'll see you there. All right, so we're um, working on this uh, neck for the nine string. Uh, we we get the one uh, completed inlay, and I I glued these things down with uh, type on, just a you know a little bit of a layer of type on. I didn't because of all the little pieces. So again, I'll go back to the one that's larger. Little pieces that it would be easy to snap off. Uh, holding it down or if I if I super glued it uh, a lot of times I'll just super glue it and lay down just a dot on it just so that I don't have to hang on to it so tightly but in this case uh, with all the little pieces I was afraid that if I well Tracy and I might snap something so I glued it down a little firmer problem is getting the uh, the inlays off once traced now this inlay as you can see uh, has a short tail and uh, that's because that snapped when I was taking it off. It, it won't be a problem of course putting it back in once I have it routed out the cavity so but just to kind of quickly and I don't know how much you'll be able to see while I'm you know fiddling with it but just with a visor on and then I just angle it to to my advantage while I'm while I'm working on it and uh, just fairly lightly trace around it because if you go if you if you put a lot of force on it then you can't move because the knife cuts in but you just need a pretty light scribe around it but just uh, you know trace it several times so that you do end up with a consistent line and uh, that's scribed all around once you once you're down you know well enough below the surface and once you have the uh, inlay off then uh, you just take some chalk chalk it and then you know dust off the top so just the chalk sticks in the little little scratch line we're putting in here so I'd already did did this side uh, do it again here it's real easy with uh, with these little blades to to just wander off into the grain of the wood rather than stay up tight. So you want to make sure that you're you're staying in tight to the edge of the inlay, or you're uh, you're going to have some false lines in the chalk, and uh, that's going to bum you out. And actually, this one I'm doing right now is one I'd already uh, I've already done. I'm uh, I'm working on this other guy. This next guy here. This one I'm not sure you can tell, but there's some kind of dark outline around the thing here, and I'm uh, trying to figure out another way to pull these off a way that will melt the uh, Elmers. I, um, I heated that one, and it worked okay, but as you as you know, I already mentioned, I snapped the tail off. So I was trying to just uh, brush some um, what was that acetone. Because I know uh, this is this is abalone. It's not going to be harmed by any chemical I put on it. But uh, I tried uh, brushing acetone down around the edge of it a couple times, letting it soak, and I wasn't able to to get it to to budge with that. And so I'm going to try denatured alcohol next. I'm not a chemist, or I'd know what what will soften Elmer's. It seems like uh, heat and water would do it, and that's probably what I'm going to end up going back to uh, but I thought I'd try my chemicals that I have at hand so uh, denatured alcohol and then if that doesn't work I'll use some lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner and acetone are really close to the same thing so all that yammering I'm gonna just continue to just scratch around this thing and uh, there are places that are going to be impossible to actually scratch because they're just too, too
too tight and this thing is angled so you have to turn it around and uh, use the square end down to the point In situations like that rather than scratch as much I just poke them straight into the wood and then uh, just kind of do a little dash mark around and follow it that way now some of these things especially once they start getting smaller like these um, you know there are places here that I am not going to be able to scratch and there's definitely pieces of this little critter that aren't coming off of here in one piece and so um, going to be pretty much scratching a uh, generalized oval around some of these things and uh, planting it in there and doing some fill around it. Can't, uh, it's tough. Now when you do a flash picture, you can see some of that stuff. I had a little bit of a gap around this paw here and I filled it and you can't see it, you know, basically even with the magnifier on. Uh, but if you do a flash photo on that, it because of the way the, the wood reflects the light, it shows up. It's kind of interesting because it picks up that it doesn't have the consistent grain pattern. So anyway, uh, obviously when you get smaller and smaller like this, it's going to be virtually impossible to get down around every one of these little things there. So it's going to be a, a, a little bit of a broader brush, so to speak, and just get a hole in there and then backfill it with, uh, with some dust. So, but that's the process sharp a sharp uh, X-Acto knife blade and uh, if you get tired of changing blades you can even take and re resharpen it on a stone just to give you a good little edge there so I will bring you back bring you back in when I've got something going on here I'm gonna go ahead and bring you back in after a while and and route, route a pocket in let you see that Okay, um, change, I had the 16th inch in here, or excuse me, 32nd from uh, the last time when I was finishing up the first one. And I moved it back up to the 32nd. I did all pretty much all of this with the 16th because once I started, uh, even though I had a small bit, it was I had to replace my Dremel. The Dremel, the bearing on the Dremel was making such a, light, a wide loop that it was... Uh, taking out a lot bigger path than a sixteenth of an inch. So, um, I've got it set somewhere just a little past half of the thickness of the thing and once I get close to most of the lines here I will um, I will swap out again to the one thirty second and then get right up to the edges then I'll start fitting fitting the actual piece of inlay that um, you can't really tell, you know, until you put your magnifiers on that these things are kind of cut on a slight taper so the top is a little proud of the bottom which is good because if uh, you get you get to a point where you start sliding into it and you just have to open it up a little bit to, to drop it in so you keep things tight. If you trace the uh, bottom edge, the bottom edge is actually smaller by the time you get all of that um, worked itself down there you've got gives you some room to, to screw up so there we go not sure uh, I do have the light on I have to have the light on uh, unfortunately for my sake I hope that doesn't wash it out too bad but um, we'll see and you may or may not be able to see what's going on I'll try to hold this thing with my fingers out of your view so you can kind of see where I'm going here.
didn't try to rev it before I stopped it, just went the wrong way. Uh, so, go to the dark there now, you can kind of see where I didn't go. I didn't go into this little foot area or up into this foot area. This little limb is pretty skinny to this little area here or down to the tip of the tail. So I'll change, I'm going to change to the smaller cutter um, and then I'll just, you know, let it drop down to the bottom of the route right now and then we'll just work very, very slowly into these areas and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll start fitting it and then if we need to, we'll, we'll go deeper with it. Uh, it's okay if it ends up being a little proud. I know on this guy here, while I was outlining it, I kind of chipped a toe off the top edge, so um, it's not going to be the exact shape that was there originally, because I'm missing a toe up on top. If I let it sit up higher than it needs to be, you know, if I leave it proud, I can sand file the top of this uh, inlay off on this one to where I'd, I'd get that third toe appearing again because it's kind of just chipped off on an angle and I can gain that back by flattening the top off. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn you off here and just continue on. I just reviewed the last bit of footage that I did on this because it's been a while since I've done this and I wasn't sure what I'd already mentioned. So, um, unless some another little bit of uh, footage turns up, um, I left you somewhere around, obviously I don't have these, uh, you know, completely done, cleaned up and all that. I believe I was just working on the second inlay, which is this guy, and it had a broken piece off of the tail, and you can see that that looks fine. Um, I've, I've watched uh, over the years before I even tried to do any inlay, and I'm certainly not speaking from a position of strength here. This isn't something I do all the time. I'm just trying to uh, to do that and make things a little more interesting. Um, I never really hear about people talking about filling. You know, I do know, I'm talking about what I do know, um, like Gibson headstocks and Gibson logos. Um, they, they had um, black paint on their head, headstocks and they would do their logos and they would, um, you know, they didn't have to be that careful about inlays because they fill them and then they would end up painting and scraping back the black paint around the inlay and they would even fill around the inlays with black so that if they over scraped and got, let's find out where I'm at, yeah, so if they over scraped say and got out past where the inlay was, it would still be black uh, showing. And then so when they shot their final lacquer over all of that, uh, you couldn't tell where it went from black paint to black epoxy fill. Uh, if you were, if I was, if this was an ebony board, and uh, I had some, you know, some fills, you wouldn't see that either because ebony is such a dark, tight grain. And where you do see it is when you start getting into rosewood or you get some of these newer. Uh, not newer wood, but different types of wood that are now being used for for uh, fretboards. Um, Zircote thing, you know. I've used bloodwood. Um, maple certainly isn't a new wood for a fretboard, and you don't see a lot of inlay in maple because it doesn't show up real well. But uh, some of these woods that have more pronounced grain are more difficult to to fill without it being somewhat noticeable. But I do believe that filling has always been kind of a standard and expected thing to do. Although, I guess all the guys that I've watched don't really talk about it. Um, so, if, if you're not experienced with inlay and you get this, you start to feel like, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to get this as tight as I need to get it because there's going to be fill. Well, I think fill is inevitable, um, regardless of. Uh, how experienced you are with inlay or whatever. So, and uh, and and I think if you do it a lot inlay and you just know that you're going to be filling, you don't think about it. It's just part of how it works. Um, so, having said all, I'm not making excuses for myself. I actually think that these pockets I did. Uh, I, 
I did one, two, three, four, five, five inlays down the neck here. Um, and what I've done basically is I went ahead and traced them all, got all of the inlays off of the glue and uh, without breaking anything else. And then um, got my first, my first depth in. And I did them all with, except for maybe the very first one that was a little bigger, this guy. I uh, did them all with the 132nd uh, cutter. And I haven't had any issues. I, you know, I've gone half, half depth and I just haven't forced the thing so and it doesn't show any sign of getting dull or any sign of uh, any problem with breakage at all. Um, make sure I'm <clears throat> covering everything I wanted to cover. So actually, I feel like um, I've, I did a pretty clean job on these smaller ones as far as tracing and then uh, doing the, the first stage of the routing. Um, this this is the littlest one right here on the very end. Actually, the second, you know, these last two are fairly small. Um, and I, I mentioned before that um, some of these areas were going to be impossible to actually route, you know, down into and leave any, any meat in the cavity. So this is one of those instances. The rest of them are actually pretty tight. This guy right here, you can see, it looks like he's got a really big head. But what he's got, he's got the head right here and then the end of the paw, whatever you call it on a gecko, over here. And so uh, you, there's no way this little teeny uh, peninsula of wood would have stayed there. So, and it, uh, it chipped out. But there again, that's going to get filled and it's such a small, you're looking at it through an extremely magnified, if you can, by comparison with my finger there, extremely magnified uh, view. And, uh, and I'm looking at it when I'm working on it with my, my magnifying visor. So I'm at a point on all these five that that's, I'm just gonna take them down to the final depth. And, uh, and what I've been, I didn't show you previously was how I did the fill. And, um, and I'll do that and pretty much what I'm doing, I'm just using a clear epoxy and I've, I've got a piece of scrap which is gonna look like a tree uh, blown up like this and I've just been sanding the end of it off and uh, mixing it up uh, in the epoxy. The, um, I did do a fill where I just rubbed the, the dust in and then um, uh, hit it with uh, you know water thin super glue and I'm, I don't remember which one it was I'm just trying to look at it right now, but the fill, it came out a little, I think it was the very second one here, so it would have been, not that one, but this one. And there's an area right here that, that got filled. It looks huge in there, but you can tell it's a little darker. Uh, so, I'm not looking at it with my magnifier on right now, so it's hard for me to say. Um, and, and I'm not going to, well, it's it's tough. It's tough looking through the magnifier with the Dremel in your way and getting this and you know you go in to hit just a little teeny bit to uh, to give you some room because as you're dropping this thing into the cavity um, you know it's really really hard to tell exactly what's hanging yet where it's rubbing at so uh, it's it's very very easy to take a little bit too much uh, in one area or another and so that happened um, and I'm, I'm sure that it happens all the time. I'm not alone in that. Like I said, I'm not coming at this from a position of strength. I'm not an expert in, in inlay by any stretch of the imagination here. Uh, but looking at that, like I said, and it's, you can see it's really very blown up. So you're looking at the worst case scenario. The average guy, of course, is gonna come. He's gonna have strings on it. And, uh, and he's just gonna be looking at it with the naked eye and he's not going to have the advantage of this huge magnification. So, having said all that, it sounds like I'm making excuses, uh, and you take it however you want, I guess. The um, process right now, I'm going to finish. I'm going to go ahead and deepen these five, these five spots, and uh, do the final fitting on these things. They're they're all set down into the cavity, but I mentioned before that they're. 
they're kind of tapered. The bottom edge of these things is smaller than the top edge. So they may not, even though I, even when I deepen the cavity, they might not go all the way down. So I'll have to fiddle a bit with that. I try to do what I can with the, the X-Acto knife. Um, and then uh, when I do the fill, I will definitely bring you back in so you can see that process as well. Uh, not a huge deal, basically. You just mix up some epoxy, stir in the, uh, the wood dust, and then uh, goob it into the, into the gaps. But you, you know, hard to see. You just smear it all over everything. Get down here into these smaller areas, tighter areas. I will tape uh, the fret slots before I do that, so I don't have to be sawing epoxy out of the out of the fret slots. Okay. All right, guys. Next time. Okay. In that last segment, I did actually forget something I wanted to mention. Uh, I was able to just use the heat gun and um, just just heat the inlay that I wanted to take off and I'll, I'll reiterate in case you didn't see previous videos um, th these have just been glued down to the surface with type bond original type bond just a thin layer but on you know every bit of it so that as I scribed around it uh, I didn't risk breaking you know, fine, fine pieces off. And um, so I decided to try the heat gun. I was going to put, I think I did on the very first one, I put water on it, around it, and then I just heated it. And uh, what I noticed as I was heating it was that I was getting some, some little resin bubbles popping up out of the, out of the rosewood. And as soon as I saw those, uh, I figured it was warm enough to try it. So, um, in that instance, I just took a razor blade, straight razor blade, and uh, just worked right under the largest uh, place, which is the head, and got the blade under there and went ahead and just started lifting it. And as, it, as uh, at, once I caught an edge there, it just really pushed under fairly easily and uh, pulled the whole thing up without overstressing any one part, so nothing else broke. So I'll, I'll um, I believe with these two were the same process, so all of the remaining inlays were just taken off that way. And I only used water on the first one. I realized I didn't really need to have the water on there, so I just heated them up until you got you saw a little bit of uh, sweat coming up out of the board, and uh, and then they were warm enough to just just peel them off with that razor blade. It worked really well. So I wanted to let you know that because uh, that's to me that's a big a good tip to know about this sort of thing if you're trying to deal with some uh, delicate pieces and without chipping them all up getting them off the board. Okay, one more time. See you later. I got all the little um, routes or pockets routed for the geckos and um, I just uh, put a little medium super glue in the bottom and uh, clamping them probably wasn't necessary. I only put enough just to cover the bottom of the inlay. I didn't want to get any up the sides. Uh, I didn't want any puddles up the sides because I definitely wanted to be able to... Uh, let's go. Definitely wanted to be able to uh, get my fill around the edges. I don't have any huge gaps, um, which I'm pretty happy about. I am going to, I'm going to back this camera up a little bit, push that back a tad, okay, so I've got uh, five of these inlays now, and they're all just a fuzz proud of the board, so I'm going to take, uh, take one of my files and just file them down. You might be, you yep. You might be asking yourself why I want to do this now, because I could fill it and then file it. Um, uh, I'm just getting them down close to the board, and uh, I'll blow any um, dust that goes in around them out, so I'm not going to have any problem, you know, having, having uh, abalone, abalone dust uh, where I don't want it. It's, it'll come out. So, it's 
kind of what I'm going to do. Kind of, that's what I'm doing. And um, I'll do that and get my duster up. Now I'm going to, uh, I don't really need to do that yet. I'm just going to go to a little finer file. These, these file blocks, I'll, I'll go on out. These file blocks are, I, I may or may not have shown them before, but I made them for fret leveling. And then I decided that I wasn't really into filing on my fret level jobs. I think a block with sandpaper does a great job. Uh, so I use them. Ex well, I won't say exclusively, obviously I'm using them for this, but I use them for odds and end jobs. I use them a lot for uh, fret end, uh, you know, trimming. And um, I, I'm currently running a uh, Martin series, 78 Martin series, where you'll see these in action, trimming, the, trimming off the fret ends. times as well. I have a trash can right off this camera here and so I just pull over there and dust things off. I really like the way abalone looks. Uh, I've used pearl and uh, I've done some abalone uh, just in dots and things like that but I think that uh, I was looking at the different different things that the uh, geckos were available in. I think I've mentioned before I didn't cut these little critters out. That would have just been completely insane. Um, but uh, they had them in mother of pearl, white mother of pearl, and some other. I can't even think of what all they were available in. They might even have been available in turquoise. I'm not sure about that. But they just pop. Huge, huge. They, they look like they're in motion with this abalone. Especially when you move, you know, a little bit, the light really plays on this. So I got this one. Yeah, let's zoom back in there. So where am I? All right, one, two, three. Down here, this guy. He looks a little dead. I don't. I didn't get a really pretty piece for him. So uh, hopefully, by the time I get the radius in the board, it'll it will have dipped into some other areas that have more color. But anyway, that's it for now. I'm going to, uh, these are the guys I just filed now. Going to um, blow all this out and uh, then I'm gonna sand me up some dust for the fill and I'll bring you back in a little later after I uh, get ready to stir that epoxy up and uh, do the fill. Just so you have uh, an opportunity to see that process. I'm sure you've seen it uh, somewhere. Um, I don't think I've done it yet on camera, so bring you back in. All right, probably just going to go in and out on this, uh, you know, little pieces here and there, uh, just so you're not having to follow the, you know, five minute, ten minute process, whatever this might end up being. I'll see. Um, I may just cut out. I'll go ahead and roll film on it, and or whatever they call this stuff now. But all I really do is I just got a, I think it's a, 60 grit piece and uh, it's fairly worn out and, uh, occasionally if I stray into areas on the paper that are fresher and I kick loose a little piece of crud uh, a little piece of sand or grit that isn't the color right so it's not going to be the color of the wood uh, I have to fish those out once in a while um, I've tried doing this on a machine. I don't have to, and I have used a machine where I have to develop more dust for some reason. Um, but I've got lacquer on something else drying. And uh, one of the reasons I don't want to go to a machine. And the other is you just have to make a lot of, a lot of dust and sweep it up off the table of the machine. I got a wide belt um, that I use for this sort of thing. Anyway, so 
just grind away on that for a while. I'm just going to bring my piece of paper into into camera range here, and then I I have this piece of parchment paper. Uh, I inherited a whole box of this stuff from my wife because she wasn't using it. She bought it for something in the kitchen and uh, wasn't using it. So, so you can see I've I already had one go around on that before I turned the camera. So I've got a pretty good pile of that. However, I'm going to go ahead and do it maybe one more time. And I want to fill all these at once. So I have a pretty good amount of epoxy mixed up and stir that into it. While I'm doing this, I'm hoping you can hear over the other this other noise. Um, while I'm while I'm sanding this thing, I'll explain to you that pretty much all the other well, all the other ones, I've only done one fill on them, and um, that should be typically that should be enough. If uh, like I said, if I were to go back after sanding things out and notice that I had a spot where I had a piece of grit stuck in there and it wasn't it wasn't the color of the wood, uh, I would chip it out of there with the end of my Zacto knife and do a little touch up. Uh, and it's possible that as you're pushing all this in you get a bubble or something and so you might end up uh, upon radius in the board down uh, for the you know the fretboard radius upon doing that might actually end up opening up a little bit of a gap somewhere where it didn't quite get pushed in all the way. So in a situation like that you'd have to just do a little touch up. Not a big deal. Just something to talk about while I'm doing this. All right. And uh, in this case, I'm just going to go tap it on the paper. Okay, now I'm not, I'm just kind of taking a quick look through this. I'm not really seeing any, uh, any grit. Like, eh, every once in a while I see a little tiny sparkle in the pile of sawdust, so. That's kind of how you know you got some some grid in there, but I'm, it's not big enough for me to fish out. Now I'll bring this back over. In fact, I can see a couple right right there and right there. You can kind of see some sparklies in there even. Almost looks like abalone. The filing's off the abalone, but I turned the paper over since so that happens. So, um, all right. Just got some really cheap epoxy here. Um, upside down, probably. I don't know. Five minute epoxy. And uh, you know how that works. A couple. Pretty good goobers of that. That might be too much for the amount of the amount of dust I have here. Okay. Look like a little chunk of dried something in there. So I'm gonna fish it out. Okay. piece of uh, sparkle going on right there. All right, let's mix this up. You can see it's very complex, uh, about that much of that and about that much of that. Dust uh, just the epoxy ratio. I was going to take a second and put a glove on, but this is five minute epoxy and I forgot to do that, so I'm just going to go with it. Dab it over there with my uh, with my toothpick here. And uh, as you can see, I've already, uh, so, no, I was going to say it's dark over here, but I think it's just me getting my hand in the way. All right, let's stop talking. Did 
If I didn't have the tape on here, I would be trying to be neater about this, but since I have the tape, obviously it's not a concern. And I got a feeling I made it way more than I needed, but that's better than being short. Okay, you can't see that guy, there he is. So all this fiddle farting with the toothpick pretty much is, should just be, you know, shoving this down into whatever gaps there are around there. and. Uh, So I just keep doing that and then I will use my fingertip just to really make sure that we've uh, we've got good uh, what's the word penetration I guess I got good uh, good pushing goobers into the into the cracks it's the technical term so Did I mention I really like the way this Avalon looks? Yeah, I did. All right, put a little more on there, and I'm just gonna go ahead and mash it in with my fingertip. Just already got a crack in it and super glued together, so that ought to make it even better. That's why I should have gloves on and dry my fingers out doing this. And. Uh, I moved over one. All right, well, I don't know how long that process took. If it wasn't too long, I'll just leave all of the footage in there and you can just see the whole process begin and end. It's really not that involved. Um, trying to just kind of look back and see if I have any open spots anywhere. Looks like everything's covered. One little spot right there. All right, it's starting to get pretty gooey here, so I don't want to pull anything back out either, so we'll leave it alone now. All right, that's it for now, and uh, we'll let that set up for quite a while, and we'll come back in and go at it again with that file. Thank you for watching. It's been a few hours. I got it. Uh, Zoomed in here pretty good, and uh, this stuff is dry. So I'm going to start with a razor blade as a scraper and just see what happens. Uh, I, I'll probably just go to the. Uh, it's not going to take me long to decide to just go to the file. Although that's that's okay. bulk of this off just scraping it all right did that with the the razor let's try let's try the file on this other stuff here again this is my uh, my double cut course file Plugging it up or anything. All 
right. Single cap. that off now maybe If I did this sort of thing before I glued it on the neck, I could uh, could run it through the sander and uh, and do that. Although I would be afraid of taking too much off. Actually, this neck hasn't been carved at all. I could still run it through the sander. going to do that. Once again I have lacquer drying. Okay I'm going to grab a, a beam with some paper on it I think. That's what I'm going to do. I might just grab my regular sanding block. Uh, either of them handy. Sanding block. If you have not uh, done this or seen this before, this is something I got from my father-in-law when I was uh, early on in construction and he had a cabinet shop and he always had one of these blocks laying around. Basically it's just a piece of plywood cut to the right size to accommodate whichever standard size um, uh, belt sander belt you would use. This happens to be a 4x24 because that's the size of belt sander I have. So you just cut a block to suit. And, uh, and then you just slide it down in there, so it comes in pretty handy. Been using these things for years now. This is an 80 grit. not getting down there very far but um, all right I'm not going to really worry about that much past this point uh, made a little bit more I want to talk just a little bit pull it all the way out I'm talk a little bit about fretboard radiusing uh, which will be the next thing I start on here I'm going to uh, radius this fretboard and um, Radius it, prep it for frets, fret it, and uh, and have it pretty much complete as far as the fret, uh, frets end trimmed to, uh, you know, ends uh, radius, not radius, beveled, and uh, everything except for the final, final, uh, final level crown polish, which will happen uh, once the guitar is built. Um, I could do it, and. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't typically like to do it that way. I like to get everything done, uh, strung up. I really like to use my neck jig and get it under tension. A lot of people uh, think that's an unnecessary step. Um, I've done a lot of pretty decent fret jobs without it. Uh, times I've run into a little bit of an issue, I've reset it and jigged it up in the fret jig and 
uh, neck jig and have uh, been able to take care of that and typically get a lot lower action if that's what you're looking for when you set it up as if it's under string tension or level it as, as if it's under string tension. Oh, you know, I just remember too, is that previous shots of the board, if you recall, here at the 12th fret, I had these two little guys kind of pointing at each other right here on the 12th fret. And so what that gave me was one, this larger one here, and then um, just two more down here. I believe that was the way it worked out. So I ended up with one less fret marker because the set of these things, I think I explained this before, but it has a really big one, which was really way too big to go in here. And I thought about putting him in the 12th fret position, but then you end up losing pieces of him because not big enough to really span. You know, you lose the detail if you run a fret over the thing, so I decided to not use the really big one. I'm going to put it on the body of the guitar. I actually contemplated putting it on the headstock, but I'm not going to do that. It's going to end up on the body of the guitar. Um, so, when I had, since I had to peel all those things off again anyway, I decided to go ahead and use this guy for the 12th fret and just put him kind of off to the side like he's trying to get away. And, uh, and then the other little guys out the end of it. So kind of redesigned that on the fly. Um, I like it. Um, I just picked the board up to look at it from the other direction. I like it. So what uh, radiusing? I kind of got sidetracked. I sidetracked myself. Radiusing this board. Uh, this is going to be the first compound radius fretboard that I've done. A um, couple, couple things to. Uh, to think about in a situation like that is normally when you do a, a fretboard radius it would be um, I thought about doing this on paper uh, just a, a standard radius say a 12 inch radius from on both ends of the board 12 inch radius here th through 12 inch at the end of the, the board 12 inch radius on your bridge um, you end up uh, sanding it as a cylinder right so as if you had a, a round tube and you were just using part of that tube. That's a cylinder. And, uh, and you would just want to sand straight with the board, perpendicular, parallel to the board. And, uh, and then when you do a compound, you're looking at having, say, in this case, I think I'm going to do uh, nine and a half at the nut and 16 at the... Uh, at the body end, and so what you have to do there is establish a 12, or excuse me, the nine and a half inch radius up here at the nut. Establish the 16 inch radius at the at the butt end, and then basically connect the dots. And so you're now you got to think of it as a cone rather than as a cylinder. And so uh, I remember uh, I told you before I I watched the early wine video videos on um, on fretting, and um, he always made a big deal about it being you've got to be you know straight with the neck don't don't sand with the with the way the strings are are angled you know the lie of the strings you want to sand straight to the board so you know as you go over you it feels weird to not be parallel to the edge of the board but to be uh you know you're going to be hanging off one inch the narrow edge farther keeping everything straight so in this case now it's like i'm going to be doing it wrong but uh, I'm going to sand uh, as a cone, or conically, sand with the lay of the strings, and, uh, and established that. So nine and a half at the nut, 16 down here. Um, I think that'll be a nice feature on this nine string guitar. So that's the plan. I am going to uh, turn you off now. I'm going to go ahead and sand on this a bit more, but then I'm going to start. Uh, radiusing the fretboard and I'll bring you back in for that.